Okay, it's my um, pleasure to introduce Mark. Um, when I read Mark's CV, and I won't read it all out because it's quite long, uh, but he did say that I've had a long association with not-for-profit sector and as such believe in giving back to the community. Sounds like a real Rotarian, doesn't, the, doesn't it? So um, Mark uh, is the CEO of uh, Telethon Speech and Hearing, position he's held since February 2017. Mark's had over 15 years' experience in a range of general manager roles, uh, including being CEO of the St Vincent de Paul Society in WA, um, and also Southern Cross Care for five years in Victoria. On that note, uh, Rotarians, I'd like you to... Uh... I really do appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about something that's actually really important. I'll put this slide up first, because um, this is a conversation I had with the Magistrate of the Perth Children's Court. And we we're having a conversation around some of the kids that she kept seeing back. And as you can imagine, in that particular instance, most of the kids that she's seeing aged between 12 and 16 are Aboriginal boys. Um, and she says to me, Mark, I don't know if they can hear me, let alone, or I don't know if they can understand me, let alone hear me. And it's something that we've been involved in at Telethon Speech and Hearing for about 12 to 14 years up in the Pilbara. We actually support a, a community well, Onslow and the surrounding communities there, we've provided ear health supports and now have integrated that. So I use that as the platform for con conversation today. I'm not going to go too much into who Telethon Speech and Hearing is or what we do in that regard. Um, I'm sure that we've all had that background before, but this issue is a bit more important than us and certainly more important than me. What we do know is that these stats are alarming. So there's been some research done that showed 93% of incarcerated Aboriginal men in the Northern Territory have a hearing loss. Often seen as stupid, dumb, you know, disobedient. We also know because we did the work at the women's prison here in WA that Aboriginal women were four times more likely to have a hearing loss than non-Aboriginal women. We also know that there's been three or four generations of currently living of Aboriginal people who've never understood what good ear health is. And while I'm talking about ear health, we'll talk about how that translates into speech and language in a minute. We've recently started working with the Perth Children's Court to try and support these kids. They are one step away from being incarcerated. And I know that I would never want to go into that Banksy Hill um, facility, let alone any of the others. So what we're trying to do is keep them out. Every single child, we've had one child who currently has an ear health pathology. Every other child has had a history thereof, which means they've probably got some scarring, some barrier to hearing. And for us, we know that that actually creates a barrier to speech and language development and participation at school. Every single one of the children that we've been associated with in that program has a language and comprehension issue. So we are trying to see how we can actually be, play a part of that and support that development so we can get them into schooling and have, start having some success and build up what is the basic literacy frameworks for those kids. But we are probably a few steps behind because Aboriginal kids are off air, can't hear, or if it's probably the best way to describe what they're going through is if you put your head underwater, that's probably what they hear. And they would like that 10 times more than a non-Aboriginal child in this state. It's, they actually have the worst ear outcomes of any group anywhere in the world. It's right here in our back door. And we know statistically for all children, not just Aboriginal children, between 10 and 20%, depending on the research you have a look at, also have a speech or language delay or disorder by the time they reach school. How does that compare? In the US, it's between 10 and 15% and across the board. So what we are looking at doing at the moment and what we've started to do is have a look at how we look at this as a continuum. How do we actually support their ear health to create better speech and language outcomes to then create better literacy and learning frameworks for these kids? Well, but I've said that we've been doing this work for 12 years up in the north and there's been others who've been doing it for longer. So why doesn't it work? What's the thing that's stopping us actually having success? Because my job is to do us out of, a, out of business. So I want to go and play golf. Um, so we've solved the problem and I don't have a job anymore. That'll be nice. 
Um, but what we're seeing is that we're seeing a very metal, um, medical interventionist model, which you come in, you provide a clinic, you nick off. So there's nothing left there. It's treating, if I've got a middle ear issue or a burst eardrum or anything like that, which is all really important, but it's done as a silo. And what we're not doing is actually saying, okay, well, what does that then cause? What that delay for that child? How do we step through that to support the environments that they're in to create the best uh, speech, language and literacy framework for those children so they can learn and participate in school? We also know that a lot of these services will drive in, drive in, out, fly in, fly out, and not connect. And anyone that's worked in any regional town will know relationships are everything. Unless we're going to create those relationships and build the framework where the community can, community can start to take care of itself, then we're never going to have success. All that we're going to do is keep me in business. The other part of that is it's designed by specialists who come in and say, hey, we'll come and hit this day at this time, you need to turn up. Not understanding what's going on in the community, not understanding the key markers, whether it's Aboriginal or Aboriginal, I don't, I'm not talking about that anymore. Um, it's around that community need, what services are in that community. So we don't then go in and overlay five different visits for one practitioner in the same two days. You know, there's no design stuff. It's like, we're here, we're done. And surprise, surprise, everything's designed and developed in Perth. So if we're dealing in Meriden, as we do, um, in terms of some of the work, we're not designing it from a Perth-centric framework where we've got access to ENTs, paediatricians, all of that sort of stuff. Well, unless you're on the public wait list, you've got access to paediatricians and ENTs. Um, we're actually designing stuff that actually meets the community need. Um, I was talking to Jeff before about the wheat belt, and I've used the... Um, a forgotten zone um, as the title for this particular slide. It is from a bureaucrat sitting in Silver City, which is what we call the health department in East Perth. Um, their design framework is that this is close enough to town, so why can't they drive in? It's only three and a half hours. And we're talking about Narrenbeam before. We had a parent who used to drive her five year old son for, um, plus one or two other children from Narrabeen to our service in Wembley on a Thursday morning to get there for nine o'clock, stay overnight, drive home on a Friday to go back to the farm to try and get that language development for that child. They shouldn't need to do that. Four out of the top 10 ENT hotspots, which is the phrase that the State Health Department used in 2015, I think it was, came from the wheat belt, including Meriden, including Narragin, including Mora. Um, there's not a solid, strong, large community there that actually warrants a lot of the service delivery. And we know from talking with organisations like w, um, the WA Country Health Service that they're severely understaffed. Yet they want to protect their patch, which is, again, not uncommon. What we also know is that trying to get specialist supports in there to stay in the town, I'd never get a... a speechy based in Bruce Roll. I won't get a speechy based in Onslow. Onslow, you go and get your coffee from the pub in the morning. It's a tiny town. We're not going to have that environment where we can do that. So we've got to have a look at how we can do different models. we are supporting teachers who often then are either very long, there for a very long time or there for a very short time in terms of the development of these kids and start to integrate models based on what they need. And I should have, sorry, I should have um, said this at the start. Daniel Lombardo who is um, one of our team. He actually is responsible for these programs in terms of implementing them. So he can talk about some of the detail. <laughs> for us, we think the solution is really simple. And I do have a tendency to go, hang on, calling out the BS of different models and it gets me in trouble sometimes. And it also gets me involved in national committees and other bits and pieces. But one of the things that we do know and we've worked really well with, and Dan did this, and maybe I'll use the Meriden example so you can read what's on the screen while I talk. That for Meriden, we've been um, in Meriden providing an e-health clinic for about seven years. And we have been one of those drive in, run the clinic, drive out. We have to coordinate with the schools and do all that sort of stuff. And it was fine. You know, we were getting the money that we're getting from Rural Health West and off we go. But about five or six years ago, Dan and I started a conversation going, this is not working. We're not changing the dial. 
So how do we do this? So it took us a while to get the funding, but we're using Meriden as a pilot, which then adds to what we're doing in Onslow, which is what adding what we're doing in Waruna and also what we're doing in Perth to show how we can actually develop an integrated model. And the integrated model is designed with community. So Meriden has a really good ear health screening program for Aboriginal kids, but not for non-Aboriginal kids. They don't have any audiologist in town. They're down to FTE in speech therapy. We've got two schools who want some support, but really don't know how to let, reach out and get their help. And we also know that in terms of the demographics around the distance from Perth and socioeconomic disadvantage and all of that sort of stuff, developmental delays, so all the data's out there. But most importantly, it's around how do we actually understand what's happening in that community at that time? So what we did is actually we employed someone to do exactly that. They're based in town. They work with all the government, non-government agencies. And we walk into that space without an ego. We're really good at what we do. I'll be the first one who said, we get great outcomes. We actually get the best outcomes in the country in a whole range of different areas that we work, but we don't walk into a community with an ego. We know that we're good at what we do and we connect up with others to know what they're doing. And then how do we actually work that through together? One of the examples in terms of that space in Roeburn, we've dropped the um, hepatitis media rates um, by 30% in five years. And we actually work with the AMS, the Aboriginal Medical Service up there to get people into that clinic and work that and collaborate that because that's how we've got to do things. And we get an 85 to 100% attendance rate at our clinics, particularly for Aboriginal children, that's unheard of anywhere around the country. For us, we need to make sure that we integrate the e-health side of things. If you can't hear, you don't speak or don't speak clearly. Probably that's my problem. I had a, I lost my hearing when I was nine, so I mumbled quite a bit, um, as Ian well knows. Uh, but for me, for us, it's if you can unblock the ears, then you can have the first step into how do you actually create that great speech and language outcome. And if you get those foundations right, then we can have a look at the literacy development that comes from that. And there are stepping stones that work through that. So how do you work through using the right phonics um, programs, the supports for teachers in those frameworks, and then how do you help the kids who have that broader need that's sitting up front that's more intensive while the teachers look at the other 20 to 30 kids in the class? So what we do in that case is we actually do an e-health screen and then we bring the audiologist in if we need to do testing. And that way we can get some devices and some support. We've got some relationships that allow that to happen. Um, but we also then go and do a speech and language screen first, and then we do an assessment. So we do that in two different steps, because then if the screen tells us there's not a problem, there's no need doing an assessment for a child which takes longer. And we do it for all kids. It doesn't matter what background you've got or where you're from or what access to services you've got. We can do it for all kids age four, five and six. And then that allows the whole class in that cohort to be supported. We don't take a kid out of a class because they're Aboriginal, because there's nothing, I think, there's nothing worse than sending, hey, you're something wrong with you, so because you're Aboriginal, we're taking you out of a class, but all the other white kids who might have a problem, oh, you can stay in there, that's fine. So we do it with the whole class. We just deal with the need, which is really important. The most important part for this is we do two things, well, three things, really. One is we give feedback to parents, so they know what's going on, and this is what you can do at home. We give feedback to the teachers, because we have teachers on staff. We're a school. So we know what that framework is like. So our teachers can support their teachers and our speeches can support their teachers too. And so we can do that in a way that we go, here's what you can do in a classroom. And then we provide services to kids. One of the great things about COVID that it taught us is we can use things like Teams and, and tele supports to provide a mix of face-to-face -face and at distance one-on-one -on -one therapies. The most important part of this is we connect up with other services. We don't want to go into a community. We won't go into a community unless we're invited, number one. And number two, if there are services there, there's no point in us coming and saying we can do it. It's around how do we connect to make the whole better as opposed to having a look at one. How do we know that it works? One of the things for us, I, I often talk about the Roeburn example about dropping a Titus media. So Titus media is the chronic disease that sits in the middle ear and is the thing that actually is most prevalent for children aged at two and uh, one, 18 months and four years. We know that that's statistically in that band that where it happens most. So it's that chronic um, middle ear infection piece. To drop that in Roeburn, given its reputation, 
is a massive kudos to the team who's involved in doing that. And being able to do that in five years where we've actually been able to get community in, we do that because we go to the elders' birthdays. And in Bindi Bindi, just outside of Onslow, we've been supporting the kids. So the elders said, we see what you do with our grannies. Can you come and do it with us? And now we can change generations of people, which means they can pass, given it's a very oral culture, they can pass those learnings back down to their kids. And so hopefully we can create habits so we're not needed anymore. Um, interestingly, and I'll point to the last part there, in Dan in his team, um, in support of the teachers in which we actually do this integrated work with, we actually try and get their feedback. And so how many of those kids, uh, teachers are seeing to change in their classroom? We also get feedback from parents and we also work with other providers, but in this case, we'll talk about the teachers. And in terms of a very short time frame, we're seeing such a, an increase or, or number of teachers who are seeing an increase in participation in their kids, in the speech development and language development with their kids, and the confidence that they've got in terms of making sure that their classroom can be effective. For us, that integrated approach is the only way that we're going to change the dial. And in the wheat belt, particularly, unless we actually start to integrate some of these services, these kids are going to miss out for another generation or two. How would we do this? Typically, this is the sort of structure that we'd go through. Um, and I, we would do a co-design process with the community. I know that's, excuse my language, a bit of wanky talk, really, but it's sit down, have a couple of yarns, make sure that we sit and work out what's going on with that community if they want us to come in there. Doesn't really show very well on there, does it? Sorry. Um, and so we do that process first and we all normally use an external party so we can be part of a conversation about where can we use our skill sets most effectively to, to build a framework that sits with that community as opposed to come in and say, oh, we can do everything. We don't want to do that. Um, our service delivery, we talk about the planning side of things and then I talked before very quickly about e-health screening, audiology testing, speech and language screening, speech and language assessments, and then continued therapies as well as that constant feedback with parents, teachers, and integrating that. So Dan's working at the moment with the teacher portal, which can give all the resources that teachers need based on their cohort of kids. So we're not talking about general strategies. We're talking about if Ian has a mental ear issue, which is then seeing a delay in speech, we can talk to the teacher about Ian's needs. And so we can target the functional areas that needs for that child, as well as these are some of the strategies more broadly that you can get a whole cohort of kids moving forward with. So everything that we'll do in that space is not only meeting Ian's needs, but it will also meet the 23 other kids in that class. One of the things that we want to do, because our aim of doing this is to say to government, hey, look, here's how you do this. We've shown you this is the proof. We don't have the resources nor the, the staffing to sit there and go, we can do this everywhere around the state. This is not possible. But there's one entity that does, which happens to be, in my view, the state government. And if we can show them the way forward, then they can take that up and then leverage off that. So our aim is to always do some sort of evaluation. We'll use the Centre for Social Impact at UWA um, and get them to do an independent evaluation about how the model is working from a community perspective, from an education perspective and a health perspective. And that's me. Very happy to answer any questions.
as we're going to see in the report that is discussed now is a key thing. Um, and I think that it's great to have all these things in place and we do use them, but one of the biggest things is trying to get those parents engaged um, and see the importance of the urgent care help. Now our schools have staff go out and and check in, you know, just check in every week to the everything the kids do and that they're doing programs. So I work very closely with Lee Smart, who probably know you and she has a lot of association as well. But um, you know, I find that a bit frustrating because I do try and get into kids at home. Um, but sometimes I just try to get that new strategy into their home. Um, I found the the little devices with their phones are great because you can use them in the kids' ears and they can see it on the on the phones and stuff like that. And our and our in our uh, breakthrough district we actually had to go down and uh, well, it's been many years ago where we put video autoscopes into all the more remote areas. Because another thing too is getting children to come back to school, particularly in the metro area, we need to share that thing on the phone. So mm. they can't see the um, the safeness of their of their homes. And how good it is in a long way to open up these these young people and thank you. Imagine coming to the metro area with the kids. So yeah, that, that is, that's the biggest thing I find is trying to get those children. And that's for us, we're, and I use the example in Onslow, if you know Onslow Town, there's the town site, there's Bindi Bindi, and then there's the airport. And so we actually go into Bindi Bindi because, again, we were invited by the elders. And then that way, our aim is if we can get the elders involved and do the kids at the same time, um, because the elders talk to us about the issues that they're having with the parents, which is often their kids, um, around making sure that they're um, attentive in there. So if we can get the elders and support them. And a lot of the elders that we know never understood, they got, we got devices on and they go, oh my God, and I wish I did this earlier. And that was the way that we try to tackle that. And we'll do that in any community that we're in as well. The centre of the kids don't go to school. So when we have like, this community liaison officer, apparently based in the town, so typically with Meriden, she actually works in Meriden College. She'll do the screen like 24 seven, 365. So that really helps pick up all of the kids to get across the kids. So you're right, family engagement is probably one of the biggest challenges for us. So it was good there. Yeah. Uh, Mark, okay. uh, Brian, Brian, um, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my background is 30 years in Croydon. I work in the living there and I'm the most uh, older community, including uh, not our uh, community is very strong there and very much have observed over time the uh, the learning difficulties. Didn't realise it was necessarily health related in time. Uh, but my question is, and I was an employer for that 30 years at Shire, uh, we uh, CBH, Shires, Health Department, etc., all screening out for uh, uh, for workers uh, and worker shortages over the years, and it's not a new thing. It's been decades on, and this is just a win-win situation. That we can get the kids at school, learning, hearing. That leads to them uh, being viable, I believe, as uh, employees in the future, and also they can remain in their own communities. We know that most of the uh, the Noongar, uh, children will want to remain on the country, and that's very, very important to have that relationship with their. Uh, with their uh, families and uh, elders. My question is, uh, have you sought through key stakeholders like CBH as to, uh, it's a win-win for them, because they'll then get employees eventually in the future that are uh, employable. Um, so what, what connections are you looking at for sponsorship and all uh, major support? We've been talking to CBH for the best part of about four years. Um, and um, it's a hard nut to crack because their giving to date has been very much localised depending on those local communities. And ideally, we'd like to do, get them to do something bigger um, and also understanding that some of the things that they're funding at the moment relate to mental health and other things as well. So they've got to prioritise that. We've got some great support from the, the Stan Perrin Foundation, who did a lot of work in the wheat belt early on in his um, career around selling different trucks and cars and stuff. So that's the approach that we're taking. 
and we've been strategic in that because there is a link between the two in terms of the governing board for CBH and, and the Stamp Parent Foundation. So we're trying to see whether we can leverage the work that we've done and say, okay, we've had success here, come on, join us. Um, we initially went to try and get the rail, the trucks and the grain, um, which was the idea that we first had. Um, and we got the rail on board, but then the other two um, at that time said, oh, look, not the right timing for us. So we will continue to work with those large, uh, we don't have the mining companies, as you all know, in terms of the, what we do up north. Um, so we will work locally with different organisations just to try and get That's the outcome. Leadership. Yeah. Um, so how do we actually do that? And we will continue to have conversations with state and federal governments as well. Um, anything that we can do to try and make uh, a difference where we've, again, I'll, I'll say where we've been invited to go into. Yeah. Oh. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. So, I'm a great fan of uh, from Anson's Federal Reserve. Throughout this whole talk, we've talked about the UN You know why that has happened. There's a health issue in the home and stuff like that. Yep. That is true. Um, we're not sure yet exactly. There's a there's a a perception that it's related to the social determinants of health, which includes cleanliness of house, diet, and the other side of things as well. Um, we're not sure yet though whether there's a physiology part to that in terms of the way that the middle ear, the sinuses and ears will drain, um, whether that's actually creating any different issues for Aboriginal kids as well. Um, but what we do know is that if we can get in and get that support early, um, then we know that we can actually prevent. So they'll get clogged ears. All kids get clogged ears. Um, but if we can prevent it becoming um, an infection and with regular screening and checking of the ears, then we know that we can get on top of it so it doesn't become a barrier to language development, which is really important. Okay, last question. Uh, firstly, I just want to say, appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, from a personal standpoint, both my parents are profoundly deaf. So the German measles outbreak back in the day. So the interventions that they had as a kid, like I think my mum went to Shenton Park or Monson Park School for the Deaf. So absolutely huge. And I wouldn't be who I am today if, if not for that. Um, I work as a prison officer um, and I do uh, safety custody management as well. Um, so I always like to sort of see the interventions we can do in-house because guess what? It ain't perfect. Uh, and we're learning about FASD and all this sort of stuff, but it's quite enlightening to sort of hear about this and think, geez, maybe this is something that we need to implement as well. Because guess what? I don't think we do any sort of hearing checks or anything like that. And we're getting a lot of kids straight from banks who, as soon as they turn 18, they come right to us. Uh, so my prison's a Acacia prison. So um, I guess I've kind of got a question within that saying that what interventions do you think from your standpoint we can do um, in the prison system? Um, you're right. There is no screening protocols at all for children in any incarceration in this state which is a real shame. If we can clear that up, um, what we do know is that when it does happen, they're seen as being disobedient, so then they get punished, and then that continues to scaffold. So if the only thing that we could do is do an ear screening at the time that they enter, then that's a better step than what we've got at the moment. We also know, and you're right, for the kids, um, the highest recorded group of kids with FASD anywhere in the world happens to be at Banksy Hill. What we also know is that there's a tool that's been developed, which we're getting hold of from Griffith University, where we can have a look at that from a functional assessment. So FASD assessments tend to take about eight, six to eight hours. If you're doing it privately, it's about five grand. There's no way I'm going to do that for every child going into banks here. They just won't give us the money. But there is a screening tool that we can have a look at it. Three parts, combined three parts takes an hour, and we can work on the functional needs of a child, which is all we need to do. We don't need to label, we just need the functional needs. So we're having a look to see how we can provide that in WA. And if we can do that and then do it with the prison system or the justice system earlier in that piece, so when they've actually, for example, had their first time in court as opposed to their third or fourth or fifth, which often happens, then hopefully we can start to change that trajectory early. Okay. Mark, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. We really appreciate your time and Rotarians would like you to thank Mark in our usual way.